In the name of Jesus, amen. A few weeks ago in our Sunday morning Bible class, I joked about the dread that overcomes any clergy person who boards a plane to reach their final destination. Even the most extroverted, outgoing, and passionate pastors I know, with the exception of only a few, fear that the person sitting next to them on the flight will ask the horrific question, what do you do for a living? Once people find out that you're a pastor, the scenario takes you down usually one of three avenues. Sometimes people will respond, oh. <laughs> Wishing they had had the better sense not to ask such a silly question. Others pretend that those tiny two chairs in which you're stuck for the duration of the flight have become a confessional booth. While they never come out right out and confess their sins, you can hear all the ways in which they are burdened by their sin, by crappy situations of life, and the painful realities that have left them angry with God. While they try to explain it all, they're literally dying for a word of hope. Too often, however, people begin listing off the reasons why they no longer attend church. Presenting their testimony like a witness on a stand, they give every possible reason for vacating the pew and hopping on a jet plane. Most often, they're frustrated with a pastor who preaches theologically sound orthodox sermons. While the music is good and all, they'd rather hear their own personal heresy proclaimed as the truth of the gospel. Honestly, does this happen to any of you? I mean, really, when you first meet someone and they start with introducing small talk with, what do you do? Do any of you go, oh, I'm a Christian? Well... Maybe it's time we all started doing that and responding to see what would happen. I know it's hard for us Lutherans, most of us descendants of reticent Northern Europeans, to think about being so bold, but here's the deal. Either you're going to sit there in awkward silence or you'll learn to share your faith by finding entry points to graciously and delicately proclaim a word of forgiveness, freedom, and the truth of the gospel which you yourself possess through Jesus Christ. In our reading for today, Paul encourages every Christian to take part in building up the body of Christ. Paul goes even so far as to make us few suggestions about how we might put our faith into action. First, if anyone stumbles into sin because of weakness, we should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Second, we should be on guard for ourselves, lest we succumb to the temptations of the devil. Third, we carry the burdens of our fellow sisters and brothers in the faith. As Luther put it, a Christian must have broad shoulders and husky bones to carry the burdens of the flesh. Paul goes on to say that every Christian should gladly support the ministry of the word. It is necessary that all believers take responsibility for the office of ministry. We do this by encouraging and praying for our pastors, but also Christian lay people should hone their theological chops, so to speak, so that if your pastor goes off the rails, you can either correct or cast him out. And if the pastor is not available and you find yourself in a makeshift pulpit over the counter at the grocery store, maybe a table at the restaurant, or even on a public platform like social media, you can share the word of hope that you have. Lastly, Paul concludes his list of examples with the exhortation. As we have opportunity let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are part of the household of faith. But wait, you say, Pastor Cullen, you have been telling us all summer that there's absolutely nothing we have to do. You set us free from proving our faith or earning our salvation. Yes, indeed, I have been saying that. There is absolutely nothing you have to do, nothing you can do to obtain salvation on your own. 
The truth of the gospel declares that God's relationship with you has been completely restored by the work of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Because of his sacrifice alone, your sins are forgiven. And through his resurrection, new life and hope are springing up in the lives of the faithful. Because of Jesus, you are forgiven and freed to live your life guided by God's Spirit, which helps you adjust to your newfound freedom. The life of Christian liberty does not demand rigid regulations of religion. It does not mandate some moral goodness as camouflage for salvation. There are no requirements no principles, and no to-do lists when it comes to being a Christian. Having received something to believe in, someone to trust in, who has things under control much better than you do, by the way, you are free to lovingly make your way through the world, sharing and serving with anyone you come into contact with. Jesus died and rose again not to prove his power, but to offer forgiveness and a new way of life to be in the world. And so off you go, removed from the world's expectations of you and at the same time called to caring service. Where there is nothing you have to do, you are welcome to wield your sovereignty and your servitude in the world. In a tiny little treatise from 1520, The Freedom of a Christian, Luther writes, A Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. And at the same time, a Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. He explains that because of Christ's gifts of grace, all Christians are like kings and queens. We are highly exalted above all things so that those things can serve us in obtaining salvation. And at the same time, every Christian is a priest. Every believer serves as an intermediary, a go-between God and humanity. As priests, we are worthy to appear before God, to pray for others, and to teach one another divine things. The end of Paul's letter is indeed so uncharacteristic of the rest of the letter. While he has been preaching for five chapters, Paul assumes that faith has taken root in us and his hearers are ready for action. It seems that as Paul reaches the end of his letter, he anticipates that the freewheeling message causes a little bit of uneasiness in his hearers. Everybody's just a little bit on edge. Paul? Pastor Cullen? Are you sure there isn't anything that we can do? While you were unworthy and condemned before God, Christ granted to you the riches of righteousness and salvation. So why then wouldn't you freely and thankfully and joyfully with all of your heart and eagerly serve your neighbor in need? While there are a lot of things you may do, there is not one thing you must do. Remember, for freedom Christ has set us free. This good news has no other result than a thankful heart, a joyful spirit, and a generous and self-giving life. What becomes of your freedom is, well, it's up to you and to your neighbors around you. And I doubt you're going to have to look too far. Your family is a good place to start. Co-workers and fellow classmates are prime candidates. Even people on airplanes are looking for kind people and good preachers for crying out loud. While you throw off all of the trappings of this life, you carefully and gently begin sharing Jesus wherever you go. As you lovingly and joyfully serve your neighbor, remember that Christ has already lovingly and joyfully given himself entirely to you as your Lord and Savior. His righteousness was greater than your sin. His life is stronger than your death. And his salvation is more invincible than hell itself. 
So thus in Christ, you are entirely and truly free to go off to invite and welcome others to share with you and all of God's people his redemption, his life, and his victory, both now and forevermore. Thanks be to God. Amen.